we get started. I'm gonna put this yeah. in my set. Okay. So uh, very quick announcement before we start. Um, so we, you, all of you, um, have the option to attend this conference at the U. Uh, called Renewable Energy Law and Policy in the U.S. Um, so it looks like a pretty interesting conference. Uh, it's organized by the University of Utah Law School. So if you're interested, you need to email me today uh, by end of day, and then you're able to go to it for free. So you don't have to pay for it. Otherwise, I think it's like $20 if you're a student. Uh, it might be interesting. So take a look. If you are interested and you want to read, you know, learn more about it, just shoot me a quick email. Okay, that's the first announcement. And as you know, classes were canceled on Tuesday um, because of the tragic incident. And now um, we are um, going to do catch up today uh, a little bit. So very quickly on the schedule. Um, we have uh, where are we? okay we are here uh, october 25th we're going to go through optical design for recycling as well as anti-reflection coding fortunately they are both valid we should be able to cover them both okay and the one thing i did change was i changed the working out of the midterm solutions to next tuesday so okay so let's jump Right. Ten. Are there any questions before we begin? I have a question for assignment three. Yeah, go ahead. We can do a prototype or simulations. Can we do how how in depth was the prototype? Can we compensate? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So for assignment three, so let's take a quick look at the instructions. So you know there are kind of three things here. So the, the, goal, the goal of the assignment, to be very clear, is you want to make a technical case for whatever your innovation slash solution is, right? Uh, this you can do with either simulations or calculations, which basically means, uh, okay, so the, the amount of detail you want to go into, of course, the more detail, the better. But I would say you need to do more than just back of the envelope. But I'm going to leave it up to you to how much you want to do. If that makes sense. So I, I would say it depends a little bit, right, on, on the project. But you know, in an ideal situation, I would say if you can do some ray tracing simulations, that would be great. Um, and, and if that's too complicated, then doing some an, an analytical um, expressions, you know, solving MATLAB or whatever, that would be good too. But I'm going to leave it up to you. The second thing, of course, is to go into some detail on what it is. What would the demo look like if you, if you don't build it? At least show some, you know, diagrams or some detailed mock-up diagrams. Um, I would highly recommend to even just build a mock-up. Uh, it doesn't have to be an actual prototype. And of course, if you can build an actual prototype, that's fantastic. You don't have to. Uh, and if you can bring it to class, that's great. If you cannot, just make a video of it, you know, or pictures, whatever. And the last thing I would say, which we didn't talk about too much, is to do a cost-benefit analysis. So just take a quick look at the part, you know, cost of parts and kind of estimate you know, how much things might cost. But we'll go into a bit more detail on this in the next assignment, but just take a quick preliminary look at it. You know, maybe there's trade-offs on different materials, so cost versus benefit. And in each case, of course, list your assumptions very clearly. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, and just email me if you're if you're confused or anything. But you know, uh, I'll leave it to the each team. Okay, so today's lecture we're going to talk about something a little bit different uh, than normal optical design for recycling, and uh, it's based on an article from Optics and Photonics News, which is available at this link. Uh, the article is called "The Optics of Recycling." Uh, it's a really interesting article, and, and this is really for your information. It's a very useful topic. We can spend the whole class studying this. Uh, of course, we'll only touch very, very basic ideas. 
Uh, and I should also point out the, the person who wrote this article is actually the founder of a company based in Norway, which uh, builds these systems. So it's actually a real world example. So let's jump right in. Um, so, yeah. Can you try like without the headset? Uh, sure, yeah. Is it muffled? Is that way? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Uh, is this better? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is better. Okay. So, so uh, this, of course, what we're talking about here is uh, recycling of uh, materials, uh, particularly in you know, bottles, cans, and things like that. So the most obvious thing that we are all familiar with is what's referred to as reverse vending machines, RVMs. So but there are many companies in this space. So the company uh, of the author in the article is called Tomra, based in Norway, and there's a number in uh, Germany and, and the US as well. So essentially they build these big machines where you can put in your cans and bottles and essentially get something back, either credit to the store, or actual money if there's a deposit, right? Now, what we may not realize is that the back end of these machines involves quite a bit of optical engineering. And that's the part I wanna talk about uh, in this first half of the lecture. The, the key challenge, of course, is that, that, that we need to identify and sort waste at very, very high speeds. Of course, in these systems, you don't need to do high speeds, but when they are collected here, they get to some centralized facility where they need to be sorted in high speeds. So Salt Lake City has a you know, sorting facility. Uh, and they need to be sorted into multiple categories for recycling. And uh, the reason for that is that different materials have to be separated with enough purity or enough separation such that you can actually sell them in a materials market. Okay, so that's where the, the, the value comes in. And the solution is optics. And we'll talk about a few different solutions here, starting with the simplest one, which is a shape measurement techniques. So basically, you know, this is quite simple. You know, we need to distinguish between a cylindrical can versus say, you know, a, cook, a, a soda bottle, for instance, right? They're different shapes. So if there was a way you could measure the shape, you could very easily distinguish them. <coughs> Unfortunately, of course, you need very high accuracy. So some of the early systems simply use photocells on conveyor belts. So this is very simple. So you have a, a laser source, and on the other side, you basically have a detector, which looks like that, it's not shown there. Um, and as the, as the bottle or the can passes through the conveyor belt, it'll pass one detector on one end and pass the other detector on the other end. And by knowing the velocity of the conveyor belt, one can figure out, okay, how long is that, right? And doing some general, uh, generic image pro uh, signal processing algorithms, and by knowledge of what materials to expect, you can actually uh, simply sort them into different uh, categories. Um, uh, of course, as you can tell, these are not great. They're pretty primitive, in, uh, as you you know, uh, as you can imagine. For instance, if the bottles are not aligned properly, you won't get the right uh, distances. And if there are different colors, you can't really tell them apart. But they're relatively simple. The next evolution of this technology. So obviously, these are not in the inside the reverse vending machines, but these would be in a centralized facility. Uh, another approach uh, is what is referred to as laser range finding. So this is uh, also relatively simple. So basically a laser beam is uh, shot at, a, at a, the device. So, so let's take this example. So this is a crate imager. So there's a crate here. Uh, imagine a bottle sitting here. So you, they can do it a full crate at a time, but you can just imagine a bottle. There is a laser beam that's shot at it, let's say from, from here and it bounces back, but that laser beam is modulated. So the modulation, which means there's a signal running on the laser beam, uh, uh, when it comes back, is phase shifted because it's, um, you know, it has traveled a certain distance. By looking at the phase shift of this reflected modulated laser, one can figure out how much distance it has traveled. And that will allow you to fig and, uh, figure out, okay, how high is the object from some known distance. And then that laser beam is scanned, you know, yeah. and the detector, they're both scanned along the semicircle. And then you can build up a full three-dimensional shape map of this object. Of course, all of this happens extremely fast, 
uh, in this case, the, the size, to get you some si sense of size, the size is, the diameter is about 50 centimeters. Um, the, the, the point here, of course, is that this has to be really fast and you want to be, you know, you want to do full crates at a time, so very, very large volume. Uh, another interesting uh, application for this, which some of you may relate to, is shown in this uh, simple video. I just wanted to point out that these technologies are used in other areas as well. So this is an example of a range finder used uh, in golf. So some of you who play golf might appreciate this. My name is John Deegan, and I'm one of the club fitters here at the Test Center. And today we're talking about an important piece of technology for Callaway Golf, the Callaway LR550 range finder. And it's fairly simple to activate. Simply press the power button down. It puts the laser into continuous mode. And you can scan the pin or whatever else you're after. So this particular pin on our range. Yeah, so, so what's happening here, of course, is that it's a CW laser, continuous uh, wave laser, but it's modulated, right? So the, the beam is modulated. As soon as it hits the target, the light bounces back. And the, face, and the face of the modulated signal in the reflected beam is shifted. And by looking at the face shift, you can figure out okay, exactly how big, far away it is. So it gives you this a very simple, quick way to measure the distance. Yards away. So this takes a little bit of the guesswork out of the, out of the uh, round of golf for the player. They don't need to walk around and look for a sprinkler head. Simply shoot your pin, get your number, and play on. Yeah, so it's pretty simple technology, uh, but very, very useful. Of course, in a sorting system, you do a very, very, very high volume. So it goes super fast. That's the key difference. So um, uh, the next evolution in this technology has been stereo vision system. So basically using cameras. So instead of having uh, lasers scanning the objects, we can actually rely on two cameras uh, looking at um, the object. And because there are two cameras, you get binocular vision and you can do image processing for very fast, accurate paper recognition. This is, of course, inspired by us, our eyes. You know, we have binocular vision, which allows us to do perception, right? So you can perceive that the object is here as opposed to here versus here. Okay. So you get this three dimensional depth perception. Um, so two eyes. And so, by the way, the depth perception today is used in uh, 3D depth cameras, for instance, in the Microsoft Kinect, where you know we use it for video game uh, playing and so on. So there are different technologies for this, but binocular stereo vision is probably the simplest way to do it. There are other approaches as well. So you can imagine two cameras, like your eyes, essentially being able to map out a shape and being able to do image processing to figure out, okay, if this is a can, Aluminum can be a plastic, and you know, it's a different. You know, it's a, what is the color of the plastic? Whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. So a few things on the uh, economics of recycling is very, very important to understand. In addition to the technology, is that there are various different kinds of markets. So first of all, there are single uses, multi-use containers. Of course, the, the difference there is obvious. Single use means that once it's used, it gets either crushed and reused as uh, something else. A good example is um, uh, certain types of plastic being reused to make fleece jackets, right? Um, or it could be a multi-use container. For instance, glass bottles could be simply cleaned and reused again, right? Uh, both, are, both exist and there are different value propositions for both. Of course, in the case of single use, um, the value of a, of a recycled product might be less than the original product, which, which is referred to as downcycling. So the, the price one can, one can command on the recycling market is a little bit less. In the case of multi-use uh, containers, this value is maintained. So quite different economics there, obviously. The second thing to consider is the container deposit. Uh, we know that in many states, we have a deposit uh, you have to pay. So if you buy a can of Coke or something, there's a deposit that you put down. Uh, in Utah, I believe we don't have it, but in many states, um, I'm familiar with the one in New England, in Massachusetts, for example, there's like a five cent deposit. And of course, that deposit, uh, you can recoup that deposit by taking that container to one of those reverse lending machines and putting it into it and you can get the five cents back. Uh, what's really interesting is that in a very um, successful market where this works, the, the participation rate is something like 90%. 
which means that 90% uh, of the people uh, basically return their cans to get the money back. But that also means that the 10% of the people don't actually return it, right? They're, they just, they're not bothered to return the cans, which is an interesting situation from an economic point of view, because 10% of the deposits simply remain in the system. They're not claimed, right? Which is a pretty significant amount of money in, in, in big uh, population markets. Uh, particularly for uh, in New England, this is uh, for sure true. And what that means is that that uh, funding essentially can be used to finance infrastructure and operations. So it has some interesting, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting economics in the sense that the non-participants actually finance the equipment because the equipment itself, especially for the large sorting centers can be quite, quite expensive and big. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. In, in non-deposit markets uh, like we have in Utah, the, com uh, the, the market is essentially driven by commodity prices. So there is no deposit that you can claim, but um, if you sort the, the aluminum uh, with high purity and crush them down, then you can sell the aluminum for, for commodity prices. And the commodity prices, of course, vary up and down, but generally, um, if you can um, increase the sorting accuracy and keep the cost down. That's a pretty big uh, industry, a pretty high margin in this profit margin industry as well. Uh, of course, in this case, the purity of the return materials is the, probably the most important factor, which is where you can charge higher prices. So this will drive the optics design. So it's a good example of, you know, you, you think about the profit margin and how that affects the technology. We'll come to this uh, when we talk about the actual uh, optical system design. Um, the two other things to keep in mind, of course, accurate sorting is re uh, related to the purity of the return materials and, the, and of course, efficient transportation because you have to move these things and fuel costs can be high. So these are important driving factors as well. By the way, you will relate to all this as we, uh, oops. It's my wife texting me, so um, it will relate to um, all these things when we talk about the commercialization plan in the coming in November. So we'll start focusing on these cost factors and things like that, and of course how you can design technologies to uh, address some of these cost factors. So recycling plastics in general is challenging because they're all transparent. Uh, and one of the most successful solutions today is what's called near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, many of you might be familiar with it, but it's the idea is relatively simple. So you look at the fact that if you shine uh, infrared light, near-infrared light, so this is the wavelength, about 1.5 microns to about two microns, through a piece of plastic, they, the different types of plastic absorb differently. So this is plotting the transmittance of the light as a function of the wavelength. Uh, so let's take an example of this red curve. It's saying that, okay, at 1.5 microns, I'm getting 80% of the light passing through. 20% is absorbed or reflected. And as I change the wavelength, it increases the more light passes through. But suddenly, as I go to about 1.6, 1.65 microns, it starts dropping. In other words, a significant portion of the light is absorbed now. Okay, and what's interesting is that this curve is a signature of that particular type of plastic. Okay, so this orange curve in this example corresponds to, let's see, uh, it's, I guess hard to tell, probably polycarbonate. Um, and, and, and if you look at this black curve, you can see it has a slightly different signature. Okay, it corresponds to polypropylene, PP. So by looking at these spectral signatures, you can actually distinguish them. Otherwise, by just looking at polycarbonate or polypropylene to your eye, they look the same because they're just transparent. Okay, so by, and by using uh, this uh, spectral signatures, uh, spectral transmission signatures or absorption signatures, you can actually tell them apart. Of course, with some image processing as well, signal processing as well. One other thing which is nice about this technique is that this is independent of color. So you can have a, a green bottle or a, or a blue bottle, uh, but they buy, both are uh, plastics, right? Uh, but they will both give you the same signature because, because the green and the blue dyes essentially have effect in the visible end of the spectrum, which is below the spectrum, not, not in the near infrared part of the spectrum. 
So you have some advantages there as well. So here you can see various plastics are ma mapped out. Polycarbonate, you see polycarbonate, PET is a common plastic used in, uh, in your phones, uh, displays and things like that. PE, PEN, PVC, we all know this polystyrene is used in a lot of biomedical stuff, PP and so on. So a lot of bottles, of course, use PET and uh, polypropylene. So, of course, then the question becomes, okay, how do we get the spectra, right? It's obviously an optical system. So first of all, you need a source of light, right? You need to have a laser, typically, that can scan these wavelengths. Nowadays, people are starting to look at what are referred to as superluminescent LEDs, which are a little bit cheaper than lasers and more energy efficient, but typically they're lasers that you can sweep the wavelength. And of course, on the other side, you need to have a detector that can measure the transmitted power. And uh, that generally turns out to be expensive because uh, you cannot use a cheap silicon detector. You need to use something like an indium gallium arsenide or something like that because it, this is beyond the band gap of, of silicon. Yeah, you will learn more about the band gaps in relationship to wavelengths when we talk about the review, review of solar cells in a couple of weeks. So a very simple approach is to use what's called a correlation spectroscopy. It's a relatively inexpensive and simple technique where a, a broadband halogen lamp is used, which has all the wavelengths. And we saw an example of halogen lamp, in one of the uh, of the spectrum of a halogen lamp, one of the early lectures, and an Indian gallium arsenide detector, which is of course a little more expensive than a silicon detector. But it's a if you buy a small detector, it's not terribly expensive, and then you put a a filter wheel with plastics attached to it. So you see all these windows with plastics in them, okay? Various kinds of plastics. And then what happens is that you, shy, you, you put the, uh, the bottle that you're interested in um, uh, sorting in front of this, okay? And then you shine the light through both the plastic and um, uh, the, the window here, sorry, the, both the bottle and the window here, and then you detect a signal in the detector behind. So you get one value for each window as this wheel rotates, okay? So you get one value here, another value here, another value here, another value here, and so on and so forth. And these are all different kinds of plastics which have been pre-calibrated to give a value for uh, its transmission. Now, because every plastic which you put in front of it will have a characteristic signature, the numbers that you get from these windows will also change with the characteristic signature of the plastic bottle you put in front of it. So you can essentially do a correlation of the values that you get. So in this case, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 values. And those 12 values will have a, a, a fingerprint that corresponds to a certain type of plastic. So what that, and, and you can correlate that to a type of plastic and be able to sort it. It's like the poor man's way of creating this spectrum. So instead of actually measuring the spectrum, you're simply getting the 12 values which somehow represent the spectrum. Obviously not exactly at these wavelengths, but at the wavelengths corresponding to the transmission of these, these windows. Uh, and of course, because you can spin this very fast, you can do it quite quite fast, rapidly as well. Uh, so that's the near-infrared spectroscopy part of it, but you'll also notice it has these red uh, filters, blue filter, and the green filter. So there's two green filters, two blue filters, two red filters. That you can use to, and you have a silicon detector behind those filters, and you can use that to essentially detect the color of the bottle as well. So in this particular system, in a, in a single spin, you can get not only the near-infrared data, from these flat transparent windows, but also the color data from these red, green, and blue windows. So it's a very simple technique, very fast. Uh, by putting, and this is an example of one of these machines, you put the bottle in, uh, you can't see the laser and the detector, but it's back here. Uh, you spin it really, really quickly, so it can also be conveyor loaded, and it can very quickly sort it into the type of plastic as well as color. Now, even though this is a relatively simple system, you still have to mechanically spin this disk. So uh, the next evolution of this technology is to develop what is referred to as a diffractive optical element. So this is a pretty cool technology. Uh, 
So let me see if uh, I can explain this. So this is a diffractive optical element for low cost spectrometry. So the idea is uh, pretty simple. Uh, in this case, uh, there is a fiber optic source here. So that fiber uh, is actually connected to a, to a lamp or an LED, which has uh, the spectrum of interest. In that case, you know, it's about 1.5 to 2 microns. But it acts like a point source. So the light comes here and it is incident on this diffractive optical element, or a DOE, it looks like that. Okay, and it's metallized, so it reflects light. It's very similar to the holograms you see in, on your credit cards and things like that. But of course, it's much more complicated. And what this DOE does is it does both focusing and spectrum splitting. Okay, this is very similar to a spectrum splitting lecture that you will talk about next week. But, um, so we'll <coughs> revisit it, but this is a reflective device. In any case, well, so what happens is that light at one wavelength is focused here, shown by blue, and at the other extreme wavelength is focused here, shown in red. So let's imagine this is 1.5 microns and this is two microns. And all the wavelengths in between are essentially focused into little dots. Now, there is a single element detector, which is fixed, so it doesn't move, okay? What happens is that this DOE is simply on a little spring that oscillates at very, very high speeds, at resonant frequencies, like that. Okay, very small angle, two degrees here. And as it oscillates, different points kind of spin across. They move, like shown here, the pattern simply changes. And as it moves, the different wavelengths simply start showing up on the detector. So instead of spinning the wheel here, we can rely on this really, really, you know, orders of magnitude faster resonance scan to get the same or even more detailed information of the spectrum. So it's a very simple, you know, and th this can be very cheaply made like uh, DVDs, uh, stamped out like DVD. And uh, this whole thing can be relatively compact and fast and, and relatively inexpensive. So a very clever, so it's an example, it's a very good example of a clever optical design, which was used to solve a very specific problem. And these uh, systems are currently in use, uh, primarily in Europe. So it's a single diffractive optical element used for beam splitting, spectrum separation, and focusing. So this is very relevant to us, as we will come back to this in one of our subsequent lectures. Okay, so a few other things, of course, is that once uh, the materials are sorted um, at a local facility, they go to a very large-scale material sorting facility where you know, typically municipal. Uh, in Salt Lake, it's a city scale, and other large-scale waste essentially, con and this is important because it contains valuable material resources, um, but requires very fast high-throughput sorting. The typical examples are 30 tons of waste per hour, so it's just ridiculously huge, as you can imagine. Um, as we saw before, near IR, near infrared, and visible spectra are captured with high spatial resolution, um, but really uh, very, very high speeds. Um, and the reason to do this is, of course, as I said before, it's uh, the two options. One is the deposit market, then there's a, you know, money in the system from the people who do not participate in the system. Or if it's a non-deposit market, the material cost. So, you know, for instance, aluminum has, uh, you know, price of 70 cents per pound back in 2016. It can be melted and recast into containers other forms. PD plastic, uh, you know, has some cost, can be turned into fiber. So, please, so that, those drive economics. And they basically support these very large scale processing facilities. Um, this is an example of one of those machines. They generally have huge um, conveyor belts which run across uh, large very fast uh, spectroscopy system. So a uh, schematic is shown here, where you can see the, the materials coming from the left-hand side onto the conveyor and it's passing really fast through this conveyor belt. And here you can see there's a sorting mechanism. So it's, uh, it's either this silvery looking thing or the gold thing. And if, it's, you know, if the, the computer decides one thing is gold, it, it shoots a pneumatic gas, which pushes this uh, gold looking bottle into this part and the silver part goes here anyway. But how do you make that decision is by spectroscopy. So in this example, you have light coming in, uh, usually from a laser, and then the, uh, the 
sorry, the light's coming in from the side and the light reflected back is collected in this scanner and some image processing uh, with, uh, with various kinds of spectroscopy. It could be like the diffractive optical element as before, or it could be just with the, with the filter wheel as uh, we saw two slides ago. So various ways you can do this. Okay. So the last thing I want to show is just a quick video of one of the sorting facilities you be used not in a, to oh, actually, uh, this is interesting. So I forgot, I forgot about this. So this, uh, I wanted to show this to you because this is a good example of a video produced by one of the teams that worked took this class about three years ago, three or four years ago, who took this on as one of their projects and they created this really cool idea. So I'm gonna let it play, it's about five minutes, but I'll try to narrate through it as needed. But what they did was basically, this was their final uh, submission for the final um, uh, assignment for the class. If you recall, you have to do a short video. This one's about five minutes, it's a little too long, so you should try to make it much shorter. But this gives you an example of, uh, what can be done. So let me quickly play it. Optical plastic sorting method by simply reading the SPI resin code on the consumer plastic waste. Distributed Plastics LLC is backed by Bean Shen, a PhD candidate, and Joseph Bogue, a master's degree student, both at the University of Utah's Electrical and Computer so Engineering did a good, pretty good job. Currently, consumer recycling is done in a big box manner whereby large trucks go from house to house picking up recyclables. They then take these recyclables back to the plant where they have to sort them, compact them, and bail them for sale. Although this big box sorting method is proven day after day, these sorters are expensive because of advanced methods of discrimination. These sorters use visual and infrared wavelengths, some microscopy methods where actual elemental makeup is determined, X-ray imaging for difficult materials, and lastly, the human element for anything that might have been missed. Although these big box sorters are a marvelous piece of engineering, they come at a large monetary cost, both initially and through time. Now, in a recent case study done at Salt Lake Municipal's Recycling Center, they recently made a $7 million sorting capability upgrade. This upgrade is a great improvement for them. However, if recycling in general is done in a distributed manner instead, these types of costs can be greatly reduced. Now, before we get into the innovative technology, we need to review plastic resin. Remember that plastic is a synthetic material made from a wide range of organic polymers, like polyethylene, PVC, and nylon. These polymers can be molded into virtually any shape and are easy to recycle if kept in the same resin family. This is why it is important. Keeping these polymers together allows for efficient recycling and more dollar per bale. Yeah, so that's an important that's point true. just to reiterate yeah. that the reason you want to keep them separate is because if you mix them, it's very hard to process them. So that's why it's very critical to separate it out. I forgot that's to mention true. that. It's possible. So you've all seen those quotes. Now, simply yeah. put, our innovative idea is a smart garbage can. This smart garbage can will take the plastic bottle, find and read the SPI code, and drop it into the appropriate internal compartment. It is centered around consumer plastic bottle waste and will automatically sort it as you walk away. It has eight columnar sections, one for each SPI code, and one as overflow, with a center hollow section that will contain smart electronics. Above this center columnar section is a dome to top it with an enclosure that holds the plastic bottle on an incline. When the bottle is dropped in, the algorithm reads the SPI code from the image, determines which pin to rotate towards, and opens the door, lets gravity take over to do the sort. Notice here in the prototype overview. So the, I, I, I like this idea, as you can imagine, because it's very, very simple, right? And there's a pretty clear reason why this is nice. So, uh, I mean, it, it will be useful. For example, a high resolution camera sends an image to MATLAB. The detection, the patentable detection algorithm, then decodes the SPI code and sends that value out via serial data to a microcontroller. The microcontroller then drives a stepper motor and actuates a door to open, dropping the bottle and sorting. 
Actual prototype results show a noise-induced hand-drawn images sent to MATLAB. MATLAB detection algorithm for successfully detecting the SPI code and sending that data via serial to a microcontroller. The microcontroller then correctly drives a stepper motor to the correct SPI code location and a LED will blink showing or simulating that a door has opened. Now, yeah. So just, just so you know, they, they actually too. did bring a prototype to class, which moved that arrow uh, to the right number. So it was, it was a good, very, very good project. But of course, then the question arises, who, who is going to pay for it, right? So they actually, that was the challenge in this part of the project. So the next few slides address that. So they've tried to address this here. Controlled is that Salt Lake County conservatively has a potential for a 30% increase in volume and a 3x decrease in cost if using a distributed plastic sorting. That's nitty, the nitty gritty of this claim follows. Salt Lake Municipal yeah. per week has a capacity, conservative capacity of 336,000 kilograms per week. Another conservative estimate of our distributed methods shows 431,000 kilograms per week, turning out as a volume. Another conservative estimate over 30 years shows our distributed method costing $22 million, whereby large big box sorters have a infrastructure maintenance and overhead cost of $7.5 million. Again, it is, reflects our claim as 3x reduction in cost. Remember, distributed plastics, LLC, Okay, so, so it was a little involved, but uh, we'll talk more about the cost benefit analysis in the subsequent half of the semester, but just keep in mind that's part of the analysis we have to do. Okay, so the last video I wanna show, this is quite short, is to give you an idea of where optical sorting is used. This is actually a very, very important technology being used all over the world in many things that I think about. So, so here optical sorting is a big machine, German company, which is used for sorting grapes. And this is uh, of course applicable to everything, like right? avocados, tomatoes, apples. So you get an idea of what happens, and these are optically sorted. So let's just watch it for only a couple of minutes. Clearly a very important technology. Right. So that's one step of separation. This is a pretty poor separation. And then you can see the speed at which it goes. It's pretty remarkable. On the on the conveyor belt. Uh, and it's optically being sorted inside this machine. At, at these speeds. So it's pretty remarkable uh, the, the amount of technology that goes behind it. As we talked about, there are systems used to work into red at the gas color. And this is the slow motion. So you can imagine how fast it's going. So you can see the flash of light and the little pneumatic injectors that are pushing things off. See the little injector. And it's happening incredibly fast. So it's not just the detection of that, but also the algorithms, right? So they have to be really, really high, really efficient. 
get the idea. So you can imagine this being used in almost all agriculture videos, also for pharmaceuticals, whatnot, like right? this huge amount of all kinds of things. Okay, so you got a flavor. I think that's the last slide here. So you got a flavor for how optics is applied in recycling. And, and uh, I highly recommend if you haven't already, please read through this article because it gives you an appreciation for the different approaches being used. Um, it goes into a little more detail than what we did in the, in the lecture notes itself. Okay, so the next topic I'll stop here and see if there are any specific questions uh, before we jump into entire reflection coding. Okay, if there are none, then we can jump right in. Um, so in our topic here, the next topic is entire reflection coding. So entire reflection codings are also quite ubiquitous as we will see, so let me see if I can. How do I do this? Okay. So oops. So what is that? What is anti-reflection? Of course, anti-reflection, as the name implies, is a coding that you place on transparent windows typically uh, to prevent light from being reflected out. So if you wear glasses, uh, without anti-reflection coding, you can see the reflection of what someone is looking at. It looks pretty bad, right? So it's very distracting uh, for the person looking at you uh, compared to this is the situation with anti-reflection coding. So all, very little light is reflected back. So obviously, aesthetically, this is nice. Um, few other applications, of course, you can see here, if you are actually person seeing through the glasses also having, not having anti reflection coding can be quite bothersome because you see light reflected off from the sides. So you get better view with, with, uh, with that AR, AR anti reflection. Um, some examples here. Uh, here, there are again good examples of what you might see with them without anti reflection. This also can be considered as glare. Again, an example here. So, pretty important technology. Uh, so, Generally speaking, you know, if you have a, co a film on top, you have hundred percent of the lights coming through, we will calculate and we'll see about, if you don't have anti-reflection coding, about 4% of the light is reflected off in the visible for glass. That means only 96% of the light will pass through. Uh, and if you use anti-reflection coding, you can get 0% reflected off and 100% passing through. Of course, this is important if you're trying to couple light into solar cells, right? You want to reduce the amount of light lost by reflection, so you want to get all the light in. So designing a good anti-reflection coating is important for solar cells, which is the reason why we're talking about it. So we'll look at a few approaches of how to design so, um, anti-reflection coatings. So the first approach and the simplest approach, uh, probably not the most effective approach, is a quarter wave coating. So to understand how to design a quarter wave coding, we need to understand the concept of interference, which uh, doesn't exist in geometrical optics. It only exists in wave optics. So we need to take a quick review on what this means. Uh, and there's a very simple video, so I'm gonna play that first. See constructive and destructive interference. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen that we have two waves, wave one and wave two. Each of these waves has the same amplitude of 50 units here are irrelevant. And the picture above here shows us what the two waves look like when they're added together. And so let's see what happens when we change the relationship between these waves. If I move the waves so that they are in phase, the amplitude of the wave the resultant wave increases. So now they are, the amplitude is very large. If I come down and I start to move them so that they are out of phase, we can watch the top of the uh, graph and we can see that the resultant of these two waves when they're added together starts to change. And so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, when they are exactly out of phase with one another, 
the resultant is that we get destructive interference and we have a resultant wave of zero. So when they are out of phase by 180 degrees, we get a resultant of destructive interference with zero amplitude. And if we move it back up to where they're in phase, the resultant is that we get constructive interference and we get the maximum amplitude. Okay, so what we are trying to do is to reduce the reflection, right? So you're trying to basically create destructive the result interference. Result of destructive showed, interference. Right? You want to make sure that the light reflected from the top surface and the bottom surface are out of phase like that, such that together when you add them up, you get nothing, right? That's a zero, no, nothing reflected back. So that's the idea of how to design an anti-reflection coating using this technique. So let's do a quick exercise, okay, with our current knowledge. So let's imagine there's a you know, glass cover on top of a solar cell, okay? Light coming in, some of it's reflected, as shown by the ray A, okay? The refractive index is one, this is air, this refractive index is N prime, this refractive index is N, that's silicon, let's say that's glass. The ray B is simply passing through the glass into silicon interface reflected off the silicon and passing up. What should this thickness D be such that the ray A destructively interferes with the ray B? Okay, I'll let you think about it for about a minute. Now feel free to discuss among yourselves. Maybe 30 seconds. You should know the answer to this because we have already kind of talked about what this means. Uh, does anyone have any comments, any thoughts? Feel free to shout if I can hear. We'll have half a wavelength as opposed to the bottom of the back, so it'll be off Right. Correct, so we saw in the video here that if you, the way you can create, and if we move it. you can create destructive interference by making one wave shifted with respect to the other wave by one half of the wavelength. So this is the wavelength, right? The peak to peak is one wavelength. So if this moves one half of the wavelength, it's exactly off and it'll get to zero. So that's what you wanna shoot for. So you wanna make sure that this ray travels an extra distance of one half of the wavelength. Okay, so you wanna make sure the ray A and ray D are out of phase by pi or lambda over two, the lambda is the wavelength, and it will destructively interfere. And then you can calculate what that means, right? Because the optical path length is n, n prime times D, and then you can see that it goes through 2D, right? It reflects off here. So N prime times 2D should be equal to lambda over two. So you can compute, sorry, that D equals lambda over four N prime in this particular example. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the reflectivity, of course, or reflection uh, is of course a function of wavelength as we know, right? as we, we just saw, it's lambda over 4n, which means that as you change the wavelength, the reflection can change. So in this case, uh, this is uh, the plot reflection of bare silicon, which is quite high, right? Most of the light's reflected in the visible, this is the visible range. Uh, it, silicon looks like a mirror, which means that most of the light's reflected. This is if you put a glass cover on the silicon. We're talking about silicon because it's a common solar cell material. So if you put glass, there's a little bit reduction in the reflection, which is good. So you're capturing more of the light, reflecting less. But if you use a proper anti-reflection coating, you can actually get it to be zero, right? The reflection is actually zero, as shown by this green curve, but only at one wavelength, at 0.6 microns in this particular example. At other wavelengths, you still get some reflection, but it's pretty low. So this might be good enough for many applications. Another thing to keep in mind is that the reflection is also dependent upon the angle of incidence. So if you have a very small angle of incidence as shown here, you'll get a small amount of reflected light. As you go to a larger angle of incidence, you get more light reflected. Okay, 
So this is an example of a, a coding on top of a class. And you can actually see this quite easily. If you look at a window at a very steep angle, you can actually see some reflected light, right? It'll act like a mirror at a very large angle. But if you reduce that angle, you can actually see that the mirror is actually transparent. You see very little light. So in other words, this depends upon the angle of incidence. So if you plot the reflectance of angle, of angle function of angle of incidence, you can see it increases. So when we try to design anti-reflection coatings, it's very important to think about these things, right? What wavelength are you uh, intending to use this device with? And also with what angles of incidence? Because there's, uh, it's not possible really to design an anti-reflection coating which will work at all wavelengths and at all angles. There's always some compromise. So it's always a design problem. So let's do another quick example. Uh, in this case, we have a silicon solar cell with a silicon nitride material on top of it, which is very, very common material used to protect silicon solar cells. So this is very commonly what's used in a practical device. So the question here is, what is the thickness of an anti-reflective coating of silicon nitride to reduce reflections from a silicon surface at normal incidence and at 45 degrees incidence? Of course, uh, to answer this question, um, uh, we can work it out by simply drawing the light, right? You have to minimize the reflections uh, from the silicon surface. So you have a portion of the light coming down here, reflecting off, a portion of the light coming down here and reflecting off here. So you want to make sure those two destructively interfere. So as we saw before, you can simply make this thickness equal to lambda over four times n where N be the refractive index of silicon nitride. Um, at 45 degree incidence, it will be slightly different because you have to take the angle into account. So at normal incidence, you have an answer which shows like that. 2D, because you have to bounce off here twice, right? You have to so you pass through it two times. So 2T, 2D times N prime, which is the refractive index of nitride, is equal to lambda over two. So D is simply lambda over four N prime. For oblique incidence, if Q is the angle, light comes in, some of it's reflected off here, some of it's reflected off here, and you wanna make sure these two destructively interfere. So what you have to do is 2D times N prime divided by cos Q, right? That's this path length here, is equal to lambda over two. So this is the extra path that the light traveled, it must be half wavelength more than this path. And again, you can write D is then equal to lambda over four and prime times cos Q, right? So you can see as you increase the angle, you have to increase the thickness of the anti-reflection curve. So it becomes harder essentially to make it anti-reflective. There is a more general, so, so the, Interference is, of course, uh, a one approach to design an anti-reflection coating, but however, it doesn't really work in practice because it's very sensitive to the wavelength and very sensitive to the angles. So in practice, you have to generalize this, right? For sunlight, we know we have a ton of wavelengths and uh, most solar cells see all kinds of angles, right, during the course of the day. So you have to design something a bit more general. And this approach to designing a general anti-reflection coating is referred to as an index matching. So let's see what that means. What that basically means, the reason for reflection from an interface is the difference in refractive index. In other words, if you have light going from air with refractive index of one, some material with refractive index of n, there is this big mismatch in the refractive index. And this mismatch is what causes the reflection. Okay, we've seen this before. So to re one way to reduce the reflection is to reduce this mismatch. In other words, if we could somehow magically make a transition region where the index smoothly varies from one to n, then you can actually prevent all the reflections. And one way to create that smooth variation is to create multiple layers so that the index varies smoothly. So you have slightly lower index in this layers, even lower index here, and so on and so forth until you get a very low index. Okay. Unfortunately, of course, this is hard to do because as very, very low index close to one is difficult to achieve. Uh, one advantage of this approach is it's incoherent. It doesn't depend on interference compared to the previous approach. So it can work for all the wavelengths, 
and it can also work for many angles. So it's a very nice approach. And uh, we won't go into huge detail on how these are designed, but I'll show you a couple of examples. So one brainstorming uh, example, uh, which I'd like you to think about, is how can you think of ways to achieve this effect? Um, we won't actually do this uh, in class, but in the interest of time, but I would highly recommend you think about it yourself, and we'll look at a few examples in the next few slides. So one approach is to create uh, these conical structures. So this is actually a silicon wafer, bare silicon wafer. So this is from a, a project from Harvard, which then got commercialized into a company called, uh, I forget the name of the company, but uh, they have a brand name for this uh, silicon called black silicon. So this is a conventional silicon wafer, which looks like a mirror. So you can see the face of the researcher. And this is the black silicon. Okay, and it absorbs all the light, so nothing is reflected back. And the reason it looks like that is because of the nanostructures. So you see these little gr uh, grass on the silicon. And this grass is the very interesting property that it is wide at the bottom, so it's mostly silicon, right? If you look down here, as you go up, every layer is less and less silicon until it reaches air. So on an average, the refractive index is going from all silicon to no silicon. And that's a gradual variation here, a good example of a gradual variation. Um, so the, the, this is a very nice uh, application. By the way, this is used not only in solar cells, uh, some advanced solar cells, because it's not quite cheap yet, but it's also used in uh, CMOS image sensors, so to be used in some very high sensitivity cameras and things like that as well. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, so that's the ad uh, website uh, on black silicon. Um, it, this is from a few years ago. Uh, this is from uh, actually National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, but there was a company out of Harvard that commercialized this. So, and there's a closer look at the nanostructures. You can also achieve the same effect by putting little pillars or etching little pillars into silicon. So this is an example of what happens if you make a hexagonal close packed uh, it's not close back, hexagonal array of pillars, it looks like that. But if you make a square or rectangular array of pillars, uh, but slightly smaller, it looks darker because you're absorbing more light. So you can actually change the color of uh, how much light is reflected by essentially doing the nanostructuring. So it's exactly the same material, simply by changing the geometry of the nanoscale, you can change the color. And this is quite interesting because you can now start thinking about, okay, collecting more light where it matters, right? So certain solar cells might want to collect only certain types of uh, certain, certain wavelengths of light because that's where they perform very efficiently. Then you can actually tailor these nanostructures in order to absorb that more efficiently. So it gives some very interesting possibilities. And that's an anti-reflection layer, okay? So let's do some simple analysis of the anti-reflection layers. So this is taken from the same paper that we talked about in last class on statistical ray optics. So the analysis we'll do is very similar to what we did in the last lecture. And the system is uh, air, so N equal one. And there is a PMMA coating, polymethyl metacrylate, which has some texture in here, refractive index 1.5, and then the silicon. So that's our solar cell, N equals 3.5. T incident is the transmission from air to PMMA. Eta is the absorption factor at the rear surface of the PMMA, so here, okay, any light absorbed here, which includes, of course, light transmitted into the silicon. And the reflected light is simply T incident times one minus eta. That's whatever is escaping out into the system. Now, goal is to minimize that. We can also calculate absorption at each reflection event and add these up. In other words, if you have follower ray, light comes here, some of it's uh, absorbed into silicon, some of it's reflected, okay? Some of it is reflected again, some of it can escape, and some of it is reflected here, some of it escapes down. So you can compute all of these events, right? Lots of lots of them. So let's follow it one by one. This first absorption is just the incident times eta. Eta represents the fraction that is absorbed in silicon, okay? Uh, remaining comes up here, and then whatever is reflected can be computed as one minus eta, okay, times T incident, which is this reflected, 
multiplied by what is reflected from this interface, which is one minus t bar escape over two n squared. This is something we saw in last class. T bar escape over two n squared is the probability that light actually escapes. It has to be within the critical angle cone, right? Remember there's this high index, that's low index. Uh, you can review the lecture from last week just to make sure you understand it. And the second reflection looks like eta times t incident. So eta is what's uh, absorbed. So this is absorption, not the reflection, sorry. Eta multiplied by t incident times this whole term here. Okay, that's absorbed, remaining is reflected, and so on and so forth. So you can see uh, if you add up all these terms, the first absorption is that, second absorption is that, and the third absorption and so on, you will get a series. You get a, the pth absorption essentially looks like eta times t incident times one minus eta raised to p times one minus t bar escape over two n squared raised to p. The total absorption is simply adding them all up, right? It becomes eta t incident times one plus this term plus this term squared plus this term cubed and so on and so forth. So it's an infinite series. And of course, from high school math, we know how to solve this. It's a geometric series. So very easily we can write this down as eta t incident divided by one minus the term that is going on. As long as this term is less than one. Okay, so we come up with a very simple expression for the total absorption of light based on those multiple reflections that happen inside the PMMA silicon interface. Now we can plug in some numbers. So refractive index PMMA is 1.5, silicon is 3.5. So we can see how much is uh, absorbed or passes into the silicon, which is one minus what is reflected. So this is the Fresnel reflection coefficient. Plug it in, you see about 84% is absorbed in each pass. Okay. Uh, and what's T incident will be on the top interface, so it's one minus the whatever is reflected from the PMMA air interface, which is 96%. Okay, we know that 4% is reflected, so 96% is transmitted. We can also approximate, like we did in the last lecture, that the probability of escape is approximately equal to the probability of coming in. So that's about 96%. So now we can write the absorption itself, total absorption, T incident times eta, so it's 96.96 times 0.84 divided by all this stuff. We compute it to get something like 92.3%. So, if so, just let's make sure we understand what we are just talking about, right? If we put a PMMA coating on top of textured silicon, we can get 92.3% of the light to go into the silicon. Now recall, if we don't do anything, in other words, if we compare this to just bare silicon, we know that about 70% of the light will be reflect, uh, will be absorbed, right? That's this number here. That's this number here. Uh, actually, sorry, uh, not this number, but it will be N silicon minus one. So that, that if you work it out, it will be about 70%. So you're getting over 20% over in increased absorption by simply putting a coating of PMMA, a plastic, on top of uh, this texture in silicon. So that's a nice, uh, pretty big uh, improvement. So just to summarize this in comparison, about 90% of the light is absorbed in silicon and the PMMA silicon interface. So about 10% of the light is reflected back. So PMMA on top of randomly textured silicon acts as a pretty decent anti-reflection coating. Note that if no PMMA or texturing was present, the reflectivity of a polished silicon wafer, which is what I was saying before, is N silicon minus one by N silicon plus one squared, it's about 31%. So we have basically reduced the reflection from 31%, remember it looked like a mirror, to about 10%, which is quite good. By all we have done is textured the silicon and spray painted it with plexiglass. So fairly simple idea. Uh, we can also think, uh, of course that's not optimal, right? We can also think of designing an optimal system. What if you want to do a simple index matching with an ARC on top of polished silicon? Let's say we don't want to texturize. So here we have silicon, N3.5, an ARC of refractive index N, 
air is one. What is the total loss by reflection of in the presence of an optimal ARC? So again, this is a problem that you can work out yourself, but you can think about how to design this ARC in multiple ways. In this case, now we're not thinking about the thickness here because we're not concerned about interference. We're simply thinking about an index matching. So generally speaking, you want this refractive index to be in between 3.5 and 1, right? And you can choose anything in between, and it'll always be better than not putting in. But you, you can actually show that the best approach, there are two approaches. One is you can take the average, right? Or you can take the geometric mean. So both of them give roughly similar numbers. So we'll work out the average first. You take the average, 1 plus 3.5 over 2, you get that. And then reflection one and reflection two basically refer to reflection from the one is from the top surface, reflection two is from the bottom surface. So the reflection one from the top surface is simply that, about 15%. Reflection two from the bottom surface is that, it's about 7.4%. And approximately speaking, you simply add them up for the total reflection to be about 22%. So obviously not as good as putting down the PMMA. So even an optimal anti-reflection coating is not as good as texturing the silicon and putting simply PMA in front. Okay, which is of course much simpler, easier thing to do because to get a refractive index of 2.25 is not terribly easy. So again, just to summarize, what I'm talking about here is the PMMA plus texturing proves to be an effective anti-reflection coating due to the effective light traffic. The extra bounces allow it to give more chances of it being absorbed, essentially. So it's an example of light trapping enhancing the anti-reflection properties. So reflectivity becomes about 10%. So we should keep in mind that all solar cells are encapsulated in glass for protection from the elements. So there is always a reflectivity of 4% at the top because the glass refractive is 1.5. So reducing this to 11%, you know, is, is pretty good since 4% is still only the best one can hope to achieve. Uh, this refers to the fact that by putting the textured PMMA, the textured silicon on yeah, PMMA on textured silicon gives you about 10, 11%. So that's what we're comparing. Okay, so that's uh, basically the end of the lecture. And I just want to, uh, what I want you to remember today, what we covered is uh, the anti-reflection coatings, very basic design of using index matching and using uh, quarter wave designs and why anti-reflection coatings are important, also quite important for solar cells. And we also talked about optical design for recycling and optical systems used for recycling, particularly related to spectroscopy. So I'll stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, up with them? Yep. Any questions? Yeah, there is one question. Okay.